Welcome everybody to episode six of The Web Show. Where did the last five weeks go? I don't know, but they've been fabulous with our episodes. Hope you have caught them. Last week, of course, we had Alex Ross I mean, what a legend. Uh, I wish I could draw. I mean, literally, when I try and draw anything, it just looks like an egg with legs and arms. In this segment, we showed a, a picture that Alex drew when he was 12. I mean, ridiculous. If you missed it, there's a card right now with the link to that episode. Anybody who's a fan of, you know, kind of Marvel illustrations or generally the sort of, you know, the magic of that world, he is an absolute legend. Also, a lovely guy, when we went and filmed at his house, he had an incredible basement just filled, like the best man cave I've ever seen. It was incredible. It was just... He had like a life-size silver surfer, he had the Flash Gordon yeah, pinball, pinball machine. Yeah, pinball machine. He had literally cabinets lined of all Marvel figures that he's drawn and other stuff. It was, it gave Bob's Bee Cave a run for its money. Speaking of? Yes, so coming up, make sure you stay to Bob's Bee Cave. We've got some more fantastic props. If you've got props that you own, comment down below. Maybe you want to come on the show and talk to Bob. Have you got a fantastic prop that you haven't spoken about before. Time to get involved, people. Comment below. So before I introduce our next guest, I want to mention there is a competition. Oh, related. we love a competition. We love a good competition. Competition related to this next interview. So stay, another reason to stay to the end of the show to find out how you can win this very exciting prize. But I would like to introduce a director called David Weiner. Now you may have heard of these documentaries. There's In Search of Darkness, the one that is upcoming is In Search of Tomorrow, and before that there was an In Search of Last Action Heroes. But David directed In Search of Darkness, and he is directing In Search of Tomorrow. They've got a really active community as well of, of kind of fans and everybody kind of involved in talking. It's a really, a really good model of kind of people coming together to celebrate and enjoy different genres of film. And these are epic documentaries. I mean, massive celebrations of a really high amount of volume of films from these genres. So without further ado, David Weiner. So David, thank you so much for taking the time to chat to me. You are part of some really incredible documentaries coming out, already out. Can you explain where all the, the In Search Of concept came from and, and about the documentaries? The In Search Of Darkness, In Search Of Tomorrow, uh, prior to that we did In Search Of The Last Action Heroes, that all comes from executive producer Robin Block. Uh, he has a company called Creator VC, and he came up with this wonderful idea to just this wonderful journey back to a decade that we love. But it doesn't necessarily have to be the 80s, but that's where we're starting. So he got together with Oliver Harper uh, to put together In Search of the Last Action Heroes, which is this wonderful look at uh, mostly 80s action heroes from Stallone to Schwarzenegger and Van Damme and everyone in between. And uh, while he was putting that together, he said, 80s horror, that's the best thing. I love this. I love those movies. They make me smile. There's such an amazing following and loyal community for those movies. So let's do that one next. And that's pretty much where I got involved and where I got, uh, I was invited to write and direct this film, which ended up being a four and a half hour opus uh, and a love letter to horror movies. It did really well. Uh, it was wonderfully received and, and we couldn't have been more grateful to the fans for being showing interest and, 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 and wanting to share this and go binge watch horror movies after watching this long film, uh, which flies by. Um, credit to my editor, Sam Way, for that. And uh, so next up, we have two follow-up films. One is In Search of Tomorrow, which covers 80s sci-fi movies. And we're also doing In Search of Darkness Part 2. And that's we're looking to get that out in, uh, in, in the fall. Just to touch on the In Search of Darkness Part 2, that is still in the 80s genre, is it? Absolutely, yeah, yeah. that's still 80s. That's a continuation uh, of what we have already done for In Search of Darkness Part 1, where we have a lot of the same contributors and interviewees, the icons of the 80s, uh, everyone from John Carpenter to Heather Langenkamp and Kane Hodder. Uh, but we will be doing uh, a number of new interviews uh, alongside footage that we never even shared or no one ever saw. We had a wealth of material because for In Search of Darkness, we sat down with upwards of 50 people. And we all sat, we sat, I sat down with them and uh, for 
on the average an hour each, sometimes, sometimes an hour and a half, sometimes even more. And so you do the math and you end up with a four and a half hour film that seems kind of long, but there's a wealth of material that just is untapped and waiting to be seen. And I'm uh, putting it together now and uh, we're starting new interviews now. And uh, I'm just incredibly excited because there's just so much more material and it. it's, it's just a, a, a natural continuation of In Search of Darkness. I mean, I have so many, so many questions for you as you talk because I, I love horror. And I mean, you, like you say, there's such a huge fan base for it. And you were just reeling off some of the names that you have interviewed, which I'm incredibly envious of. Who were some of the most amazing people that you had interviewed or the most interesting characters? You as an interviewer know that uh, every interview has a different dynamic, a different feel to it. Uh, there's a lot of what's what you want to get for the end result, but you find that interviews go in on tangents. And if you have, if you're fortunate to have the time to go down rabbit holes with stories, you end up with with a lot of material that you never expected to get in the first place. So. Um, you know, one of my early, I think my first interview actually was with uh, Heather Langenkamp, who I've worked with before and I've interviewed before. Uh, and she was very gracious to say, sure, David, I'd be happy to do your project. But it was amusing to me because she said, David, when she arrived, she's like, David, I don't think you know me as well as you think I, you do, because I don't like horror movies. I don't like them at all. And I'm like, well, uh, well that's good because we can, we can, we can explore that, you know, you're obviously associated with the Nightmare on Elm Street uh, franchise and, you know, you are a, a, an original, uh, what some people like to call final girl, but uh, an original horror hero or heroine. And um, to me, that was a, a very cool dichotomy where you have someone who's associated and knowledgeable of the uh, horror genre. But personally, she has no interest because it makes her feel unsettled and uncomfortable. That to me was very cool. Um, sitting down with John Carpenter, for example. I mean, uh, he's 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 the horror master. He's an icon. He's a legend. Yet he's very self-effacing. He's very hard on himself with his output of the '80s that we all we all think is just classic and spectacular. We think the the thing is is an untouchable uh, classic. In his mind, he's like it, it failed at the box office. People didn't receive it well. It still stings for him. And so these were really interesting elements that I was able to capture and discuss and, and, and further investigate on film. And I was real grateful for that. It's interesting your comment about John Carpenter. Do you, does it surprise him then when he has these people want to interview him about their incredible love for these films? Does that help in any way his opinion of the films or he really is still stuck in those kind of thoughts? I think he compartmentalizes it. I mean, I, he knows that he is he, he, he is raised uh, to this this elevation of of godlike status, but he's a he's a regular guy, and he's an artist, and he's a creative guy, and he's a sensitive guy, and so he kind of has a bit of a cynical, curmudgeonly outlook that's lovable and not mean. But it, it's sort of a wall of protection because he, the guy's been hurt, you know, just from a, you know, when, when you're an artist and you put your art out there, uh, it, you're vulnerable. And uh, he's no different from any of us. And so, yeah, I mean, he understands why people think his stuff is great, but I think he keeps an, uh, grounded by being a little bit self-effacing. Obviously, with the hours of interviews that you did and talking about endless horror films was there what were the things that you learned that were most surprising to you like anecdotes from set or things that happen in production that you didn't know before listen i don't know it all i know I, I like to say i know a thing or two about a thing or two you know i'm always learning uh but i do my research and i know a lot and i, I i've confirmed a lot of what i thought i knew and what i didn't know doing this project uh, i would say two things you know one a very specific thing that comes to mind is uh, I was always curious about the origins of Toby Hooper and Poltergeist because uh, his name was was actively maligned as uh, he, he was not the guy who directed Poltergeist, even though he is listed as the director. Everyone said that was a Steven Spielberg film through and through. So it was very uh, it, it was very rewarding and interesting to be able to have someone say like Mick Garris, who was a publicist on that film, who could say categorically, yes, this was Toby Hooper's film. Steven Spielberg hired him because he he loved Texas Chainsaw, and uh, he thought 
Toby would be perfect for this film. Um, but I wanted to go a step further. I'm like, you could say that, but how is this evident in this film when everyone likes to see that this is a, you know, it looks like a Steven Spielberg film. And so, you know, Mick went into very select examples where he said, this is very much a Toby Hooper film because of this scene or this moment. Um, and, and, and if you look at any Steven Spielberg produced movie, Joe Bob Briggs was talking about this, you know, if you, if you look at a, a Robert Zemeckis film, you could argue that that's a Steven Spielberg film because it's got that sort of Steven Spielberg glow, but we all know and credit Robert Zemeckis for doing that. So why don't we know and credit Toby Hooper for doing Poltergeist? That's to me is a really interesting story. And it was kind of very cool to get to the bottom of that. And I have to add one more element. When I, when we, um, when we debuted, uh, at Beyond Fest, when we debuted In Search of Darkness uh, on the big screen for a live audience, uh, we, it's a four and a half hour film. So we took a break halfway through and literally at the bathroom, uh, a guy came up to me and he said, David, I want to thank you personally for how you treated uh, the way Toby was treated in Poltergeist and sort of setting the record straight there because Toby was my friend. And it always stung for Toby. It always stung for me. And uh, I, I really appreciate the fact that you made the effort to clarify uh, what, what, what went down with this film. And so that was really rewarding on a personal level. There was one other thing that I learned just making this film in general. And it, it, it was less about the anecdotes and it was more about the fans. And uh, I, I really, we all, we all have our films that we love and we love to hate and we love to consider a guilty pleasure. Uh, and then there are the exalted ones uh, that everyone seems to collectively deem as a classic, you know, like The Shining, for example, or, you know, The Fly by Cronenberg. Um, but I, what I ultimately discovered when I made this film and that I've carried over now to In Search of Tomorrow is an understanding of why people love films that aren't known to be beloved. Uh, and and that's, the, that's the personal connection that we carry with all these movies. That's why this nostalgia is so powerful. And you, you can't have a, a, a cynical judgment on films that aren't, uh, you know, well made specifically because they mean something to people because it meant something at, at a certain part of their life. You know, whether it was a, the first time they saw a rated R film or snuck into the theater to see something or their older brother or a good friend shared something with them or for me. I had a sleepover to friends who had cable and I didn't have cable. And so I said, we got to stay up till two in the morning to watch Friday the 13th. These things are the little moments that make all these movies important. And it, it has more to do with the memory than the movie itself. And that's something I really take to heart. And it has really helped me in terms of the uh, sort of the deep dive in dissecting all of these movies that it's very, we live in a very cynical and judgmental society right now, and it's very easy to uh, act condescending and superior based on your choice of what you think is better than other, what other people think. Your opinion is more important because you think that something is better and you think that what they like is not. Uh, and that's all over social media. And this is sort of an opportunity to have an even, even playing field, discuss the film itself, discuss why people love it, maybe uh, maybe come to terms with the fact that it isn't such a good movie, but we still love it because of X, Y, and Z. And uh, that was probably the biggest learning experience for all of these projects for me. I think that's why, like, you hit the nail on the head, nostalgia is so important, because I've always thought that those childhood films are like a smell, isn't it? Like one... If you get a scent of something, it takes you right back. You know, you remember what you were wearing and you remember who you were with and you remember those feelings that you get and that's what people connect with so much. Um, so it's really great that these these celebrations of classic films are coming out, I think, especially with what you're doing is you cover so many films that it really allows people to to go back to their childhoods. When with uh, In Search of Tomorrow on, on, on deck, uh, and, and we did some fundraising for it and uh, we're, we're getting ready to put it together. To me, I get a, a special satisfaction in saying, yes, we're going to cover Blade Runner, but we're all gonna, also going to cover Howard the Duck. And I get groans from people and I'm like, oh, no, this is going to be great because that movie, we all know what that movie really is. But what the story is behind it, the fact that it, it, it is a time capsule of the era 
And the things that we kind of like to laugh about it, I think, is collectively shared. And so, you know, for every E.T., I'm happy to also explore Mac and Me because it has a knee-jerk reaction. And you, you can't deny the fact that there are some people who might have seen Mac and Me before they saw E.T. And so it has a special place in their heart. But for the rest of us, we could say, what went down with that and McDonald's, you know? It's a fun story to tell either way you slice it. With both horror and sci-fi, what would, if people want to expand their horizons in the genre, what would be one film from each genre that you think is underrated that should maybe be seen by more people that's kind of slid under the radar a little bit? You ask a very difficult question, Lisa. Very difficult question. One underrated film. You know, one person's underrated film is another person's treasure. Um, when it comes to sci-fi and talking about underrated films, like you could you could talk about you know the Corman films, and you could talk about Battle Beyond the Stars. To me, that's not an underrated film. That was a celebrated film, and that that showed up at a time when everyone was was absolutely starving for something that was like Star Wars when they were waiting for the next Star Wars movie. So Battle Beyond the Stars comes along, and that that sort of ticks all the boxes. It's it's, it's it doesn't it pales in comparison to Star Wars itself. But we wanted anything that had an element or a feel of Star Wars. Uh, but I wouldn't call that underrated. But I think when you look back decades on at a movie like Battle Beyond the Stars, it's something that uh, I think has disappeared to a certain degree. So if you were there in the 80s and if you were around, you, you remember that it was in the movie theaters. You remember seeing newspaper advertisements to see when it was playing in the theater. But people don't talk about that movie as much now. So arguably, whatever the definition might be of underrated, that's a good one. If it's not that one, then maybe it's, you know, Space Hunter, you know, Adventures in the Forbidden Zone in 3D. You know, that's that that might be a, an underrated one, too. One person's trash is another person's treasure. And that's kind of what all these movies are about to all of us. In terms of horror, an underrated film, one of my personal favorites is Omen 3, The Final Conflict. And, and that... Uh, was was sort of the first time that we saw Sam Neill before he was a household name, and especially with Jurassic Park. Uh, but here it's the it's the third and supposedly final film in the Omen trilogy, and uh, you know little little Damien has grown up very quickly in a very short amount of time to a grown man. And while it's not a, a great film, there are a lot of great creepy elements, and I, I quite enjoyed that. And I think I've, I, I have a connection to that also because that used to play on HBO all the time. And again, I didn't have cable, but my friends did. It seems like The Omen was always on in some stage. I've always connected to The Omen trilogy based on the, the, the foundational story elements are so cool to me. And the fact that, uh, you know, Damien and the back of his... Uh, scalp he's got that 666 birthmark that always creeped me out and the fact that we get to see that again in the omen 3 is real fun for me so arguably an underrated horror film of the 80s good selection on that one i think i agree with you and it's all uk based and you talked about obviously in search of tomorrow in search of darkness is out in search of tomorrow where is that at and what are your plans for it at the moment Oh, In Search of Tomorrow right now, we're uh, in pre-production. We've assembled an amazing uh, cast, and we keep on assembling more folks, but uh, really hitting the spectrum of all these amazing films and genres, whether it's the filmmakers themselves, the special effects people, the artists, the actors. We're in the beginnings of production right now where we're about to go out and start doing some interviews. And what's going to happen is uh, we're going to finish In Search of Darkness, and then I'm going to jump off both feed in and uh, complete In Search of Tomorrow with additional interviews and editing, which will be going through the beginning and middle of next year. And ideally, we're hoping for a summer or a late summer release for In Search of Tomorrow. Who are some of the names that you have confirmed for it, if you're allowed to share? There's a, there's a lot of amazing talent that we've got on board, uh, it, and it really it covers all the various franchises, and we have uh, artists and actors and filmmakers and special effects folks. Oscar winner Doug, Douglas Trumbull, who also directed Brainstorm, is on board. Dennis Murin, uh, all Oscar winners. Uh, Bill Tippett. These are these are wonderful folks uh, uh, in the special effects department. Star Trek, we've got Walter Koenig who played Chekhov. We've got uh, Nicholas Meyer, the writer and director of Star Trek The Wrath of Khan, uh, writer of Star Trek 
four, writer and director of Star Trek VI. He's on board. He also wrote Time After Time, which is a 1979 film, one of my favorites. There are a couple 1979 films that I think we'll find a way to get in there because they are so impactful on the 80s as a decade, such as The Black Hole, which came out two weeks before uh, 1980. Joseph Bottoms, who was uh, Lieutenant Charlie Pizer, he's in our movie. We have Newt from Aliens. We have a couple of the folks from Aliens on board. Uh, we have from E.T., the extraterrestrial, we have Dee Wallace, and uh, you know, who played Elliot's mom. We have Elliot himself, Henry Thomas. It's a real wide-ranging uh, uh, cast. We also have a guy that you might have met in the past. His name is Sam J. Jones. And Melody Anderson, I, mean, I have you, you to thank for uh, enabling some of these wonderful cast members. So I, I, I want to directly say thank you very much for your, you know, connecting me with Melody. You're so, very welcome. Um, so many, so many folks uh, uh, on board. It's a, it's a laundry list in the best way possible. Uh, but if you, uh, if you check out our, our Kickstarter page, you'll see everyone who's on board, or even our IMDb page for In Search of Tomorrow. You'll see who's on board, and there's more to come. Sean Young talking about Blade Runner and Dune. I even talked to her. I, I sat down with her right before. We took a break with all this uh, COVID business and uh, got to talk to her also about Baby, Secret of the Lost Legend. And, you know, it's real fun because we get to not only talk about the projects that they are well known for, but also talking about their favorite sci-fi movies from, you know, the decade. You know, sitting down with Paul Verhoeven, I got to sit down with him, talk about RoboCop and Total Recall, which is 90, but, you know, you got to include that. And uh, also from RoboCop, we've got, you know, Nancy Allen. It's just an embarrassment of riches in terms of the talent, and there's even more that I haven't mentioned. I imagine that they love talking about films that they grew up with that inspired them, because so often I'm sure they're always asked about those same films that they're really known for. So it was probably quite a treat. That's kind of my warm up question with a lot of these folks. I, you know, I, I like to talk about the, the decade in general. But even before that, I just say, what are your influences? What are your favorite movies? What's the first if we're talking to we're talking horror, we're talking about sci fi. I just say, what's the first movie that you remember made an incredible impact on you? And the eyes go wide right off the bat. And they say, oh, gosh, I was a kid and my cousin took me to see, you know, Cassandra Peterson saying that her, she was like a, nine years old and her cousin took her to see, you know, a Vincent Price movie, you know, House on Haunted Hill. It gave her nightmares, uh, but she became obsessed after that. And these are these are the things that I think have a connectivity when you're talking about the, the sort of origin stories of our favorite icons, because they were very much influenced by a lot of these films and uh, it, it impacted their career and the types of things that they like to do. It always kind of comes back to that one movie that made a difference in their lives. And it's the same with us, whether we're fans or filmmakers. Well, here's that question for you then. What is the first film that you remember having an impact on you from whatever genre that might be? My answer to that question is one film from the 70s that I don't think anyone's ever heard of. It's an underrated film. It's very, very... It was very influential to me. Uh, it was called Star Wars. Uh, I haven't heard of that one yet. No, yeah, you should look it up. It's it's pretty cool. I grew up, I mean, I was born in 68, so I, I watched Star Trek on TV, and I watched Planet of the Apes, and I watched monster movies and Godzilla movies and universal horror films and Corman B movies. That was all on TV, Saturday morning cartoons. I'm that kid, and... Uh, up until I saw Star Wars in 77 when I was nine years old, I just loved it all and I, I ate it up like, a, you know, with a spoon. But something about Star Wars was different and, and that just rocked my world, blew me away. And what was different was it about it was when I left that theater, I wanted to know more about filmmaking. I wanted to know how did they do this, not can I see it again only. And I wanted to... Have I wanted to make people feel as enthralled and thrilled as I was, as exhilarated walking out of that, that theater. And I'm like, this is the greatest feeling in the world. And how can I make people, how, how can I make my Star Wars? So I want to share this feeling. It was, it was intense. And that put me on the road of discovery about uh, making films and, you know, for horror, learning about uh, not only was American Werewolf uh, an instrumental film in my life in terms of just how amazing it was, but... 
I wanted to know how. How did they do it? How did Rick Baker change David Naughton into a werewolf in front of our eyes? How, how did John Landis balance comedy and horror so deftly to make both work so effectively? And those are sort of two very important films in my life that that changed my trajectory to from being a, 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 a an audience member to wanting to be a uh, a creator. Why do you think that horror the horror and sci-fi have such strong, really passionate, dedicated audiences, probably above all other genres, I think. That's a very good question, because uh, if you're not, if listen, if you're my mom, my mom has no appreciation for fantasy. I think she, she just, she doesn't disdain it. She just doesn't connect to it. She wants to watch a drama. She wants to watch real characters doing real things, whether it's historical or whether it's whether it's just, you know, great acting and a great story. But if if there's fantasy elements, if there's imagination elements involved, she just can't connect. But I think there's a whole segment of the population that likes the escapism, likes the visceral. Uh, uh, vicarious feeling that they get, whether they're flying a spaceship themselves or they're trying to run away or get revenge on a killer. Um, people get a lot of their personal uh, psychological machinations, they get to sort of work through them with these films. And whether it's a genre film, whether it's sci-fi or fantasy or action or horror, I think there's a there's a, a an army of people out there who connect with these movies because it's very important to them whether it's on a very conscious or subconscious level they can kind of work through their elements of escapism elements of control elements of fear elements of 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 um, confidence uh, all these films are stories that 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 t tackle these in a in a different way and, and I think it's just very powerful plus. You have the whole collectible element to it, you know. You have the whole convention element. You have the whole cosplay element. People can connect with their peers this way. I mean, back with horror, when Famous Monsters of Filmland magazine came out, not only did that share amazing photos of the films that people wanted to know more about or couldn't wait to see, but there were letters of people saying, I'm a, I'm a movie fan. I love movies. I love horror movies. I love Dracula. Who else does? And you'd read that and you'd say, that's me, that's me. And, and so that was the early days of connecting with other fans and realizing that you weren't a loner, you know, you weren't an outcast, you weren't a misfit. Or if you were, there were so many others like that who could connect with you. And I think that's one of the main important elements of, of your question is people connect with the, the, out, the, outs, the outsiders, connect with the outsiders to become an inclusive club. I love that, how you phrased it. It's really well put and so true. And I hadn't been to Comic-Cons before starting to film Flash and I've been to plenty now, but it's the one place that I had been to where you really feel that you are a part of something and no one's judging and you can like what you like and just be free to express yourself and you can buy that 600 pound toy or that three pound bag of whatever it might be on it and just celebrate these things that you love. And it was the most inclusive environment that I think I've really ever been in. Well, times have changed also. I mean, I'm old enough to remember back in the 70s and in the, especially in the uh, 80s when I was becoming a teen that uh, I had to keep that stuff in, the, in, in check, in the closet, so to speak. You know, if I walked around wearing a Star Trek shirt, like with, with Spock on it, that was an embarrassment. And I could I would get comments on it, if not, teased about it, if not worse. Uh, and I wasn't alone. There were a lot of people who uh, you, you had to, it, it, the jocks versus the nerds and Revenge of the Nerds was a real thing. I mean, of course, that's obviously an exaggeration for entertainment, but that existed. Um, but the, the, the nerds, the geeks have inherited the earth. And uh, we, we've crossed, we turned a corner and now uh, it's socially acceptable if not encouraged to wear, you know, to fly your geek flag and have your collectibles on your shelf as an adult and, you know, wear your cool t-shirt and no one's going to bat an eye because everyone's doing it now. And it's a very liberating element. I mean, I, I couldn't do that back in the day. Uh, you just couldn't do it. Uh, and you had to find your friends that you could talk about it. And then you had to do it behind closed doors 
because if you were talking about it, Dungeons and Dragons too loud, you'd probably get, you know, some guy would smash your books on the floor just because they wanted to, you know, be superior to you. You know, um, it, it's an interesting element, but uh, I think we've come a long way and it's, it's great that we can all celebrate it now. Well, speaking of celebrating, your what I was particularly impressed with in Search of Tomorrow was how successful your crowdfunding was and this community that you have developed that people could be a part of. So can you just explain people who were part of your community or people who may join your community, what you offer the people that support and follow your series? We've created these, uh, these wonderful communities on Discord where we're in, in, as we're putting these films together, we're bringing a lot of the talent who are part of these genre films, whether it's sci-fi or whether it's horror, uh, to have watch parties and Q and A's. I mean, we just had a reanimator Q and A that was our, um, our debut film for the, the In Search of Darkness Discord community was reanimator. And we had Jeffrey Combs uh, come in and have a Q and A and, and, and interact with the fans and ask questions and talk about the late, great Stuart Gordon, who's also in our film. And it was real special. And you could see that he really appreciated being there as well, uh, connecting with the fans. And, you know, boy, if you could do something like that, in addition to delivering a film and, you know, T-shirts and posters and other cool artifacts where people can feel when they're not watching the film that they can have some sort of ownership. You know, my poster in the background, for example. Brilliant poster, by the way. I mean, when I saw that, I was just amazed, a bit jealous and amazed. Well, thank you. All the, all, I did not create it. Uh, but all, all, the, all these things uh, allow you to sort of connect with the nostalgia of the overall feel of of the type of thing you're delivering and you know obviously not kick not every kickstarter is about nostalgia but we're kind of trafficking in nostalgia and so when you know one of the reasons why collectors collect is you know you might be able to collect an action figure from a movie but it's not like you're watching the movie all the time so if you could have your little action figure on your desk you know you know if if, if i'm sharing Indiana Jones movies with my kid, I'm like, you know what? It's time to put Indiana Jones on my desk so while I'm chit-chatting, I can still be a kid and remember these little moments. We all like to have a piece of it and uh, hopefully never grow up. So if people want to be part of the In Search of Tomorrow, even just the In Search of Community, can they still do that? And if so, how can they do it? June 18th was the last time you could back In Search of Tomorrow. Uh, right now, if you're interested in backing and, and the future of the project, you should follow our socials uh, at 80 scifidoccom I keep on throwing the, the dot .com. You can go to 80 scifidoccom and 80shorrordoc.com, and the socials are at 80shorrordoc and at 80 scifidoc but basically, if you connect through those those uh, those platforms, whether it's Twitter or Facebook or Instagram or the websites, uh, the best way to follow these projects at this point is to get on the mailing list, get that newsletter, uh, and we'll give you all sorts of ways to access the Discord communities or to find out how you could do that next and uh, what's happening next with these projects. And those are basically the best ways to do it right now. Fabulous. And I'll put all the information too in the show notes in the description. So if anyone needs any links or whatever, it will also be down below. Um, so thank you so much, David, for taking the time to explaining these incredible films. And if you're ever in the UK, I am taking you to a pub quiz because for the film section, you will be consent. <laughs> uh, so thank you. I really appreciate it and super excited for In Search of Tomorrow and, and all your future projects. Well, I so appreciate you having me on, Lisa. It's been a real pleasure. And 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 back at you and likewise. Uh, your projects are wonderful. I'm keeping a very close eye on them. I, I loved Life After Flash, and I can't wait to see your follow-up films. Very exciting news. July 30th, In Search of Darkness is premiering on Shudder. So if you haven't seen it already, check it out on Shudder. All the links are below too for the socials, where you can grab copies of them, all of those exciting things. Um, I also wanted to do a thank you to Jason Lindsay for connecting me in the first place with David. He also connected me to Alex Ross in the first place. He's been super helpful and yep. also filming with him when we were doing Flash and him, you know, sort of getting involved, helping out with other interviewees. And responsible really for the re-release of Flash Gordon in 2007 and he does all the merchandising. So I didn't mention him last week, so I wanted to just give a shout out this week. 
now. Oh yes, next up, Bob's Bee Cave. We've got a really interesting prop. This, this is a really exciting one. If you're a horror fan, we've been talking about, you know, obviously horror in the interview, we've been talking about certain directors. This one should tie it all together really nicely. So over to Bob in the Bee Cave. Are you there, Bob? Today we get to celebrate uh, John Carpenter and one of my personal favorites is this girl, uh, Christine. Now this is not the actual thing I'm going to show you. Um, it's much, much smaller than this. Let's take a look. So you can see here, we're going to take a look at, that's right, the Power V Hero grill emblem off the original filming car. Yeah, so here it is. Uh, this is an original 57 Plymouth Fury Power V. Uh, goes on the grill of the car. Uh, what's special about this one is it's actually plated in 14 karat gold. Um, they were usually just painted gold in the uh, in the film, but for the hero shots, they had extreme close-ups. You can see it at the beginning of the movie as the title sequence goes up, and you can also see it throughout several parts of the movie, especially the famous scene at the end where Arnie dies and reaches out and touches the gold emblem lovingly. Christine is one of my all-time favorites. I'm a huge car guy, and it really spoke to me and my experience growing up with my first car. I think it's a love story. I think it's a love story about between a person and their car in the perfect, like, Romeo and Juliet scene, star-crossed lovers. Nobody wants them to be together. And, of course, the twist in this one is then... Juliet, a.k.a. Christine, just decides to go out and kill everybody. I got really excited about the idea of trying to find a Christine part, and I was just originally uh, looking for 57 Plymouth Fury parts, so, you know, I could just have, have something. And through searching, there was a guy who essentially inherited the Christine junkyard post-filming. You know, they used hundreds of cars in the movie and most of them got destroyed. And he offered to sell me front grill of Christine, which included the Hero gold-plated Power V. The original grill I got was so, so massive, I didn't have any space for it. So I ended up selling that to another Christine fan, but I kept uh, the gold-plated Power V. The cool thing about that grill was on the back of it, because they labeled all the cars, it's from a specific scene it's written on the back, Muscle 2, which was apparently the Muchi kill car sequence. Yeah, okay, so there you have it. Uh, that is my little but very important piece of movie history from the film Christine. Hope you enjoyed it, and I'll see you all next time. So it's competition time folks and this week we've got a great prize there is a link to watch the full documentary in search of darkness and what we're looking for is what is your favorite underrated horror film and more importantly why there are lots of great horror films out there but there are some real gems that are sort of tucked yeah. away that people don't know what is your favorite underrated horror film and why comment below mm -hmm. one of my ones i guess you would consider a horror film that behind the mask film we we watched where it's like a behind the scenes mockumentary of a serial killer. Oh yes. What goes on, so that would be my answer, behind the mask. Yeah, well hopefully that wasn't somebody else's answer and now you've stolen it. Well now they have to come up with something else. But please comment below. Next week, we have, again if you like comics, you're gonna wanna stick around and see next week's show, a really big name in the comic world. Are we revealing it or not? Nope. It's a big one, it's a big one. If you like your comics, you better get back and check us out next mm -hmm. week. So thank you all for watching. Please enter the competition. Very excited you could join the Life After community. 
until next week. We'll see you soon.